you know, because I've been studying this for 30, 30 years. Please let me know. Right now, though, I just wanted to see what your problems are. All right. Thank you, Bill. And this is Ruta Anyone Jordans. Else? Yeah, Ru Ruta Jordans from Zero Waste Kauai. And we're looking at C and D in Kauai. So I'm very interested on what you all find. Thank you. Uh, and for those coming on, if you wouldn't mind typing your name and uh, organization in the chat box for us, we'll make sure that we capture it for our notes properly. Thank you. Any other comments uh, or introduction from the general joining us today, general public? I wanted to introduce myself. This is Gail Suzuki Jones. I'm with the Hawaii State Energy Office. And notice that there's a bill in the legislature. Um, SB 2437 related to CND waste that um, we're very interested in. Thanks, Gail. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Yep, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to comment or introduce themselves who's joining the call? Hearing none, we'll move forward. Uh, we have a uh, wrap up of our last meeting uh, and we'll turn that over to Tetra Tech wrap up on the organics conversation we had previously right. Cesar um, no. um, next slide yes um, sorry it's just behind this slide actually we have several more slides for um, Oh, yes. Before we get into it. Okay. Sorry. It's Sorry about that, Miss. I'm going to step back a little bit. Sorry, it's not going for Oops. Before we actually get into the uh, updates, okay. there are some uh, logistics we have to go through. <clears throat> the sunshine bump. Yeah. Slide. Let's do Sunshine Law first. Sorry, one second. The PowerPoint is. We've got a little lag here. Mm -hmm. Okay, we just want to remind everyone that this meeting is uh, follows the Sunshine Law here in Hawaii. Uh, which is an open meeting law. The purpose is to help ensure the public, uh, you can meaningfully participate in the government process, such as in this plan revision. Uh, all of the ISWMP task force meetings are open to the public and will follow the state sunshine law as we've just indicated. Uh, please note to the task force, discussion on task force business outside the public meeting is prohibited. This includes in-person communications as well as phone, email, and social media communications. Thank you. Next. Our meeting ground rules for those of us joining us for the first time, uh, just a reminder for those that have been around, we acknowledge that the contributions of others are important, so please give them an opportunity to share their thoughts. If you do have a comment or a thought, please raise your hand uh, physically in the room, and if you're online, uh, please notice that there is a raise hand uh, button that you can use. Please maintain your microphones in an off position until or unless you're speaking. And then please uh, always engage with an open mind, as we always do with aloha, with respect, uh, grace, and of course, patience. We ask that you listen also with that same ear and then respond uh, rather than speaking without uh, listening to what's being said. And as I already said, we want to respect everyone and their ideas and in Hawaiian, that's just being what we call ha, ha ha being a little humble and allowing others the brilliance that they have. Uh, meeting ground rules, next. <clears throat> that was it. <clears throat> Slides are loading. Um, so we've and so we jumped in the public comments. Uh, I jumped ahead of this, but uh, if there's anyone that has joined since, we'll give you one more minute and you can please introduce yourself and offer or share a comment or a question that you'd like us to consider. I see none. Hearing none, let's move forward. Thank you for that deviation. 
So once again, we're now going to do the wrap up of our previous meeting on organics, and we'll turn this over to Tetra Tech. All righty, thank you, Ramsey, and thank you. hello, everyone, and thank you for your participation in today's task force meeting. Um, as we've done at our last task force meetings, we'll be wrapping up the last topic, which in this case was organics. Um, so these next few slides will be covering potential solutions discussed for consideration in the enhancement of organics management here in the state of Hawaii. So this uh, waste hierarchy should look familiar to you all. Uh, for those that have participated in the previous meetings, um, we've been using this uh, hierarchy to evaluate potential solutions uh, as a guideline. In addition, specifically for organics, we use US EPA's 2023 Wasted Food Scale, which prioritizes actions that prevent and divert wasted food from disposal. Uh, as you can see here on the screen, uh, the right-hand side uh, highlights different pathways for preventing or managing wasted food, a range from most preferred on the top left to least preferred on the top right. Uh, the most preferred pathways prevented prevent wasted food, donate and upcycle food uh, would offer the most benefits to the environment and to a circular economy. Uh, also prioritizes using food for its intended purpose, which is to nourish people. And then the least preferred pathways include landfilling, incineration, and sending food down the drain, uh, which also have the most environmental impacts and limited potential for circularity. Next slide. So here we have a list of five solution categories to consider, as you see on the screen. Uh, so these include extended producer responsibility, which assigns producers responsibility for the end of life of their products, uh, as well as less wasteful or resource reduction alternatives. We also have government programs and subsidies, outreach and education, as well as free market solutions. For resource reduction alternatives, we discuss the importance of supporting local reduce and reuse alternatives, such as pig farms, backyard and community composting programs. We also discuss California Senate Bill 1383, which enforces a recovery rate of 20% of edible food in an effort to reduce food waste as well as addressing food insecurity. This law also requires jurisdictions to establish food recovery programs as well as strengthen their existing food network recovery. Uh, for government programs and subsidies, we discussed several uh, US EPA grants such as Climate Pollution Reductions Grant, uh, which allocates $5 billion in grants for assistance in development of innovative strategies to reduce pollution. Another program we also discussed is the Landfill Methane Outreach Program, which promotes the recovery and beneficial use of biogas generated for organic waste in the landfills. Uh, as a solid waste infrastructure program, uh, which provides grants to uh, improve post-consumer materials management and infrastructure, uh, support improvements to local post-consumer materials management and recycling programs. Um, uh, as well, USDA uh, grant programs, including the Advanced Biofuel Payment Program, Community Food Projects Competitive Grant Program, Composting and Food Waste Reduction Grant Program, and as well as uh, Solid Waste Management Grants. We discussed expanding the existing curbside collection program in Honolulu, as well as grant opportunities in the county of Maui. Um, considering regulations that divert organics from disposal. So, for example, we assessed California's SB 1383 as well as the state of Washington House Bill 1799 Organics Management Law. We also discussed uh, consider, considering regulations to ban organics disposal and incineration, for example, in New Hampshire as well as regulations to facilitate the permitting pathway for composting activities. For outreach and education, uh, we discussed uh, promoting composting workshop events throughout 
through uh, communication outlets, so for example, newspaper, radio, social media, as well as collaborating with non-governmental organizations to organize collection events, uh, such as West Maui Green Cycle, uh, which is a composting operation that has partnered with a handful of schools to launch composting programs and develop additional education and outreach uh, resources. Uh, some outreach and education examples to reference uh, include the County of Kauai's backyard composting program, as well as an education, or as well as an educational video that they have posted. And then the city and county of Honolulu also has a dedicated website with dedicated resources specific to food waste prevention. For free market solutions, we discuss several processing options such as vermicomposting, open windrow, aerated static pile, in vessel, fully enclosed composting, as well as anaerobic digestion. Next slide. So based on these solutions that we discussed, we received feedback from task force members as well as the public. Uh, for resource reduction alternatives, uh, we discussed promoting zero waste events and making it the norm here in the state of Hawaii. In regards to government programs and subsidies, uh, we discussed supporting and enhancing accessibility for food producers and farmers, as well as enhanced support from the Department of Agriculture to composters. We reiterated the importance of partnerships with organizations, as well as grocery stores and restaurants, composters, universities, consultants, and field experts to increase capacity. Uh, as well as expanding and developing existing and new uh, community composting programs. Policy regulation and research for compostable packaging was another topic that we discussed, as well as uh, equipping a network of electric vehicles for organics curbside collection. We also discussed creating incentives for food scraps management similar to the High Five program. Uh, where certain deposit beverage containers are covered and um, receive a financial incentive for their return. Uh, we also discussed creating an ordinance requiring businesses to recycle their food scraps, as well as the importance of allocating funding to support infrastructure for food storage and pickup in an effort to support um, food recovery. We discussed modifying the permitting structure by creating an easy pathway for small scale composting, as well as composting facility exemptions for facilities that receive low tonnages. We discussed uh, investment in resources for localized testing of soil, as well as considering issuing fines for contamination, as well as composting operation registration with the state. And regarding outreach and education, uh, we discussed the importance of enhancing education to minimize food disposal, as well as broader outreach and education in regards to compulsible packaging and contamination. And then, as mentioned, in related to zero waste events, we discussed the importance of behavioral change and staying away from single use uh, utensils. Uh, we also discussed DOH partnership with, the, with Kiss the Ground to provide educational resources to Hawaiians. Uh, for those of you who were in attendance at our last task force meeting, that was um, the video that we presented on um, composting. So that was through Kiss the Ground. And then lastly, for free market solutions, we discussed expanding and developing existing and new community composting programs, as well as the development of organics processing infrastructure. We also mentioned the uh, promotion of vermicomposting in the state of Hawaii. An example that we looked at was the city of Los Angeles's vermicomposting bin program. One second. Okay. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that presentation uh, and reminders of what we talked about last time. At this time, we'd like to give our guests and members of the public um, an opportunity to share your thoughts with us based on what you've heard or your previous participation. Uh, the, the larger question we'd like you to focus on is, do you envision the proposed solutions as ones that are implementable in Hawaii? And or what challenges do you foresee? Or do you have any other, other thoughts about has been presented today? 
Uh, before we continue, though, I want to welcome uh, Nicole Chatterson. Uh, notice you just joined us, so thank you for being here. Once again, we're opening this uh, section to our guests and members of the public. If you have anything to say, please uh, raise your hand. In-house, anyone? No? Okay. I'm not seeing any raised hands on mine. Don't be shy at all, please. Uh, okay, Ruda? yes, Ruda. Go ahead, Ruda, please unmute. Yes, that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Um, I, I just had a question on the procedure. Uh, all of those things that, that I heard just listed are wonderful. But what are we actually going to do? Are there going to be bills as a result of this? Or, or is there a priority list of where we're going to start and how we're going to accomplish the organic, taking care of orga organics here? Uh, <clears throat> I'll start and I'll then pass it on to Lane to see So um, we are currently involved in the Integrated Solid Waste Management Plan update. Uh, we've identified nine solid waste material streams that uh, the state has identified potentially as problem uh, materials. Um, we are identifying uh, potential solutions by doing comparative analysis and evaluating other states to see what they are doing. So at this time, we are um, retrieving, identifying potential solutions that we are identifying to get the conversation started. Uh, as part of the task force meetings, uh, we have received additional feedback on those potential solutions. Those potential solutions would um, be integrated into the um, integrated solid waste management plan update. Uh, once that plan is updated, um, the solutions that end up making it there will be identified there, at which point um, members of the legislature could um, choose to pursue one or more of those recommendations, or at least that's what, um, what I think would be done. But at this time, um, no proposed legislation or ordinances or regulations are being identified or will be identified in the integrated solid waste management integrated solid waste management plan update. Um, yeah. Thank you. Is, is there a time frame for, for this happening? Yes. So um, the time frame for the integrated waste management plan update is. Um, late this year, uh, potentially early into next year, uh, the completion of that document. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the guests or the public joining us today in this meeting? Please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, uh, hearing none, let's move on yep. to our task force members. Do we have a next slide for that? Mm -hmm. We do. Sorry, the PowerPoint just lags. Just a few seconds. Yep. Yeah. No problem. All right, welcome, welcome again, task force members. Uh, this is the opportunity for you to share your thoughts on solutions presented and discussed. Again, in your opinion, which shows most promise would be a guiding question. But obviously, any other thoughts or concerns you may have, uh, this is the opportunity to share them. Task force members? Yes. yes. Go ahead, Tini. Christine, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, yep. I feel like the synopsis definitely captured uh, what we spoke about. And I was happy to see the part about um, 
accommodating farmers and food producers right at the top because that's essential. A couple weeks ago, I was part of a gathering that happened on Oahu uh, at the Windward Camp or no, the West Hawaii campus. And there was so much energy around farming and food production from a lot of young people, from a lot of engaged Native Hawaiian organizations. I feel like it should definitely be a priority of the state to work with that constituency and start to share ideas, see these people as really important stakeholders as we move forward with any of these ideas. So um, they do this, this food production or sovereignty summit every year. And it would be really great to see these ideas that we worked on together being brought forth and introduced uh, to this group of people. They're actively engaged at the legislature. They're in a position to generate testimony and add their political you know, momentum to the things, the solutions that we see. So the more we can align with food producers uh, on this issue of organics waste diversion, the better off we will be. Wonderful. Thank you, Christine. Other task force members? We have the opportunity for a few minutes. If not, oh, who's the hand? Who is your hand? Hello. Yes. Um, yeah, Glenn? I, I, okay, Glenn. Go ahead. I raised my Thank hand. You. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, um, I agree with Christine uh, with uh, from DOH's perspective, um, you know, in, within the hierarchy, reduce, uh, reuse, and then recycle, um, that uh, involving the farmers and um, trying to reuse the, the or organics waste as much as possible uh, prior to looking at other options is probably preferable for us. Uh, once we start looking at a recycling option or a composting option, um, I think there are still going to be challenges for that, including, um, uh, you know, ensuring contamination um, is removed from the material before it's composted so it doesn't carry on through the process, and also um, to reduce any uh, nuisances that come out of that, that type of procedure. So. Great, thank you, Glenn. Any other comments or thoughts for the task force? I'm seeing none. If you don't want to um, raise your hand and speak all, please feel free to put it in the chat. I'm seeing none. I'm seeing one. I don't see any hands there. Nope, we can carry on. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Tetradeck. We'd like to move on then to the topic of the day, which of course is construction and demolition, demolition waste. So to bring us into that introductions, please, Gisela. Thank you, Ramsey. Uh, we can move to the next oh, slide. Oh, well, hang on, we got oh, some. Um, okay, yeah. Nicole, sorry about that. No worries, I was Good. having trouble getting my hand up there. Can you hear me okay? We yes. Can. Okay, great. Um, I was sad to have missed the discussion. It looks like it was robust and great. Uh, I don't know if it's useful to add anything at this point or if that's what we were looking for, but um, I didn't see a, a conversation around the potential of um, removing contamination through uh, legislation around bagging green waste in plastic bags. A lot of the um, current green waste, at least composted on Oahu, is placed in plastic bags and then put into the green bin, which is sort of then creates an impossible task for the compost facility to sort all that out. So that could be a preventative measure to eliminate some of the plastic contamination. Just want to throw that in there. Otherwise, it looked like a great combo. Great. Great. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to add quickly that um, that is a um, 
a great item to add to the organics discussion. Uh, the compostable bag, the use or not, um, it's an item of conversation uh, associated with its, um, with organics collection at the source, um, which is really related to the uh, the yuck factor that comes up when you collect without a bag mm -hmm. and associated conditions. So uh, thank you. We will definitely add the bag, uh, compostable bag, to the conversation. Great. And then um, I see Christine has her hand raised. Christine, please. Yeah, there's also um, lawn and leaf bags. We use those a lot when we're out there doing zero waste events and collecting uh, food contaminated paper and minimal food scraps. So they're not the kind of thing that you would just like empty your compost uh, bucket into, but definitely if there's a mix of paper in there, they hold up really well. And you can buy them bulk uh, pretty cheaply. So I do think that that would be reasonable. So it's not like bioplastic, it's um, two ply paper with like an air section between lawn and leaf bags. Lawn, it's a, lawn and leaf bags. Is it, Christine, lawn and leaf bags? Like yeah, your lawn yeah. and Landscapers lawn use them. Um, they sell them at Target. We use them a lot. I have mistakenly left them in my car in the trunk for a week and come back, no leakage. But you just can't put a lot of sloppy stuff. Like you couldn't empty a soda into it, but. They work great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, anyone else? Okay, seeing no other hands or hearing anyone, let's move forward with our problem statement for construction and demolition waste. Thanks, Giselle. Thank you, Ramsey. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Okay. So as we can see here on the screen, we developed a problem statement for CND. Uh, we're not going to read the entire thing, but if you'd like to read it in greater detail, uh, it can also be found in the meeting agenda. Uh, but in summary, the main problems related to CND management include high generation and disposal rates, um, as well as limited outlets to manage commingled CND materials. Um, one thing that's also worth noting is that there is only one uh, CND landfill in the entire state, and that is expected to close soon. Next slide. Yes. So this next slide is um, an overview of the baseline conditions in the state as well as the individual counties. So in the state of Hawaii, uh, HAR Hawaii Administrative Rules 11-58.1 uh, sets the definition for solid waste and 11-58-1-19 establishes the permitting design and operating requirements for CND landfills in the state of Hawaii. Hawaii Revised Statutes uh, 107-28 states that each county must amend and adopt the Hawaii State Building Codes and standards listed in HRS 107-25 within two years after the adoption uh, by the State Building Code Council. Um, the state also promotes recycling for its own projects and construction sites under Hawaii's Revised Statutes 196-9 to incorporate principles of waste diversion and pollution prevention, such as reduce, reuse, and recycling, as a standard practice in programs, including programs for waste management and construction and demolition projects. HAR 11 501 through 504 establishes requirements regarding uh, asbestos containing materials. Uh, we also have House Bill 1406, which was introduced last year. It would require the Department of Transportation to conduct a two-year study on the maximized use of recycled asphalt across the state and would also require a report to the legislator. The bill was deferred to the Senate committee, uh, but it did not receive a hearing. Um, however, the bill is expected to be live for the 2024 legislative session. Um, I also heard someone mentioned SB 2437, um, which I don't have listed here, but that uh, Senate bill 
um, was introduced this year. It requires the state building codes to incorporate the International Green Construction Code. It sets specific targets for recycling, reuse, donating, and the resale of non-hazardous construction waste. Uh, in the county of Hawaii, uh, solid waste rule 2-5-15, which is uh, applicable to transfer stations, states that the maximum solid waste load, including C and D, um, but excluding green waste, uh, shall be three cubic yards or less uh, and or seven feet less in any dimension. Um, items that exceed those dimensions are not allowed unless otherwise approved uh, by the director. Solid Waste Rule 2-4-7 applies to reload facilities uh, and states that uh, the maximum load size for construction and demolition waste must not exceed five cubic yards unless otherwise approved. In the County of Honolulu, City and County of Honolulu Ordinance 42-1.5 states that the division shall not collect any soil, rock, concrete, explosive, liquid, radioactive material construction debris and demolition debris under a curbside collection service. Uh, City and County of Honolulu Ordinance 42-1.7 uh, states that a division must accept certain types of solid waste at specific disposal sites, and this includes um, dirt, rock, concrete, reinforcing steel, metal pipe, metal roofing, etc. Uh, in the County of Kauai, um, per County Ordinance 21-3.3, CND materials greater than three feet in any dimension are not accepted at the re reuse or the refuse um, transfer stations. And County Ordinance 902 bans the landfill disposal of commercially generated loads with over 10% of ferrous or non-ferrous uh, metal. In Maui County, uh, Building Code Chapter 16.25.1051 sets the permitting requirements for construction and renovations. Um, also worth mentioning that, um, as I stated earlier, there's one CND landfill in uh, the county of Honolulu. Uh, in Maui, there used to be another CND landfill uh, that closed in 2016 after reaching capacity. And in response to the Lahaina fires, a new landfill for disaster debris management has recently been approved in Maui County. All right, thank you, Gisela. So once again, uh, we are providing our guests and members of the public to share your thoughts and um, questions at this moment. Uh, if you want to focus on a particular question, we'd like to ask if you know of additional problems associated with CND debris management in the islands and your particular communities. Now, that would be a question. Guests and members of the public, please share your thoughts. Again, raise your hand, and we'll be glad to call on you. Not seeing any so far. I just had a quick one. Since mm -hmm. we have Joe here, can you share any specifics about the timeline for PVT closing? I was waiting for the opportunity to at least uh, raise some of these issues. I'm sure the question will be brought up. The um, <clears throat> current permit and design as far as the landfill is concerned, is four to five years. Now that was a year, year and a half ago. We are currently limiting some waste coming in and regrading, doing our operations more efficiently for soaps and nooks and crannies, basically. So we're raising that hopefully to five, seven years, maybe up to optimistically. 10 years. We think we can do that, but we, we can wait and see. Now, keep in mind, FYI, everybody, that this is a private landfill. The owners may decide to close earlier and whether we reach capacity or not. That's a business decision. That's an owner's decision. But as far as engineering, permit, and physical capacity and all that, I would say being the environmental engineer and all that um, involved with the operations and the engineering design. The capacity may, I'd say comfortably, be six, seven years. 
So it's important only because a lot of customers ask, they want to know. I'm sure the counties want to know also because of, at least with the ordinance with the city and county of Honolulu, Pomona adults mean a reaching capacity of this. That's going to affect at least uh, that information. The, um, the ways currently we're taking in, I'd say I did some uh, quick calculations. You know, and going home to it because sometimes our economy can be very robust, but it can be a, a weak one also. So that being said, we are permitted to take in 3,000 a day. We're looking at probably total of waste, uh, according to my list and our data as of the last two months. I'm looking at maybe 6,400 a week. No, and that's still a thousand under a thousand, maybe a thousand tons a day. So we're we're, we're okay. The uh, operations by the owners, and just out of convenience, is that sometimes they close the landfill, which is their prerogative only because they are a private landfill, and they can do that. And that helps towards capacity also. Um, we don't take in, we don't fill. So at this point, we can, we are allowed, and we can exercise that uh, operational option, basically. That's what I say. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate that. Thanks, Quinn. Any other questions or thoughts from our public um, and members joining us as guests? Joe? Yes, Joe, go ahead. Um, one, one thing at least during our day-to-day -day with customers is that the question always come, arises as to what can they take. A lot from haulers, a lot for their customers. So what can they take? It's difficult, if not um, kind of, you have to go through obstacles in order to find out what, because there, there's a definition of type of waste. The one thing I, I always help with customers is that it's the activity actually that generates the waste. That, that waste can be a construction demolition, we know what that is. But sometimes um, waste can be generated from an activity of a construction and demolition type of process. That can count towards the CMD also. So that being said, customers come in with a lot of stuff that they, they aren't sure and are not clear as to whether it falls under C and D. So the first thing I always ask them is, is it generated by construction demolition activity? So that being said, they, then they have to mull over it and they decide, they go back to their customers, they go back to their project managers, and, and that starts the process. So that being said, I, I need to at least put that out there because that question comes up a lot from a lot of generators. Okay. Um, in follow-up to that statement, would you say that then are you receiving sometimes customer with MSW and trying to make a decision whether it's... Under our permit and under what we believe we're allowed, we can take MSW as long as it's 10, less than 10% off the load. Yeah. So they can come in with one can, but they may be generating 20 cans. You know, and that load itself, we always try and limit it to less than 10 percent. And I said, you, however, you're right. On the question further, some of the customers would be asking, you know, I have got this, and I would define it because when I used to manage one and all adults, it's an MSW, and that's the way I'm more of an MSW landfill engineer. When I went to C and D, it boils down more to more specific on. Is the load, is the generate, is the activity generating that part of uh, construction demolition? So sometimes MSW may include it. I mean, it can be as simple as you know, you've got this can of material that uh, projects have, and they throw in C and D. Somebody throws in uh, a bag of McDonald's. That's MSW, but it's less than 10 percent of the load. It's part of blah blah blah. It's allowed. You know, what are you going to do? You start separating two? You can't. That's just part of the, and it's as simple as a definition as to what is allowed and what's not allowed. But yeah, sometimes we take an MSW, but we are allowed uh, less than 10%. And it's, it's, uh, it's 
almost impossible not to. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Do we have a comment from Glenn? We have to step out. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Uh, Glenn had to step away, but we want to provide something that he shared uh, in the chat. Clarification, the Lahaina debris site is a temporary debris storage site, not a landfill. Uh, the county will still need to site and construct a permanent landfill to accept the debris for final disposal. Um, Glenn, unfortunately, had to step away. We can't add an additional comment, but he wanted to make sure that we shared that with you all. Are there any other thoughts, comments? Uh, from our guests and members of the public. Okay, if not, let's move on to our task force members. Uh, Joe, thank you for your comments and thoughts already. Are there any other questions or thoughts that are coming from our comments? Uh, Ramsey, go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Um, since the state only have one CND uh, facility and that facility is going to shut down or close. It's not going to be in business anymore. And I think that's the one in city and county, correct? <coughs> so the question is, what is the state um, strategy to probably encourage or set incentives to encourage these type of facilities all over the state. I think the challenge we, at least we've seen in, over the years, it's really the permitting process because we treat it as a solid waste facility. So when the permitting process is so lengthy and complicated, people have less incentive to start thinking creatively about taking that demo material and start a business. So have have the state consider um, treating the CND differently than a waste. Um, it is inert material. Um, it'd be all recycled, um, but I don't know why we call it waste under solid waste facility permitting. Maybe we need to rethink and rebrand um, because construction demo takes, as you all know, it takes a lot of airspace within the landfill. Landfilling in the state of Hawaii, the cost per ton to bury is very, very expensive because as you all see, city and county, Maui, it's hard to site a new landfill. It's It's hard to to permit it and it, it takes a long time and the cost is very, very high. So that, you know, if we could start rebranding some of the things that we trying to divert and not call it, um, you know, not put it under the same category as um, municipal or commercial waste, um, call it as resources or, you know, it, it is a commodity. So just something to think about because we're going to be facing that all over the state. And I, <laughs> I hate to lose a space, landfill space, just for the sake of burying inert material because nobody wanted to start a business to take it because the process of going through the state permitting is it's very, very intensive. So just food for thought that allow the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Ramsey. Christine, your hand. You're still on mute, Christine. OK, how's that? Is that better? Got you. OK, thank you. So for the first thing you asked us to do, is there anything missing? Definitely what's missing is um, the ground beneath. So when you have these major C and D operations, as an example, the um, old Hilo Hotel, there's all of the materials that get knocked down and dragged off. And then what they do is they scrape 
the top, I don't know how many inches, and this is also happening in Lahaina now after the fire. And then all of that, my understanding is, gets taken to a landfill someplace. So there's this whole um, component of um, brownfield issues of the soil beneath the site when there's demolition. And that definitely needs to be part of the conversation. And what's very exciting about that is that there is a whole group of people here, professional people, very well educated, um, who are getting involved in soil remediation. And within our uh, policy directives or initiatives or programs or whatever we create to deal with CND waste, we have to create room for this um, innovation. We have to create room for this and there's a real potential for uh, soil remediation to have that soil treated, inoculated with beneficial microbes and to not have to take it to landfill. And then the more we build that capacity, the more then we have capacity to take things like a non-plasticized drywall, uh, which would be a diversion. And then uh, to get into the conversation that Ramsey started, I, I love where he's going, I love the thinking, uh, but the truth of it is, is there is a lot of really nasty waste Christine? Yes? Christine, uh, yes. Uh, the last few seconds you are breaking up, so I'm not sure if it's your audio or perhaps um, your connection. If you could just repeat your last few sentences, please. Okay, can you give me like a key word from when to start? Was um, it about? Pla plasticides? Um, where you're um, following up or seconding uh, what Ramsey started that okay. conversation? Okay, yeah. I second that emotion, um, but there is in construction and demolition materials, there is a lot of actual true waste, nasty, toxic, um, polymer based stuff that definitely does should is not marketable or usable. So what that gets to is we have to look at ways to create grades of materials and this gets to certain separation. And there is definitely this attitude that on a construction site, you absolutely cannot ask the workers to put their McDonald's in one bag and their reusable or, or um, valuable materials, resources in another pile. No, um, none of that. They just have to be allowed to throw everything in one place and we just have to get over that. And um, the way we get over that is making sure that we are charging premium for dumping construction and demolition waste. And then on site, there has to be this incentive. Look, you guys, you work for us. This uh, tonnage costs us a lot of money. So you're going to reduce that tonnage by putting things in the right place. Definitely, definitely have to get to source separation. And then we're able to collect materials that are truly reusable because this is the waste to wealth gold mine, okay? If there's any kind of materials that we're managing in the state that have the potential to generate wealth, it is construction and demolition materials. And so we do have to get people to source separate on site. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Floor is open for any other members of the task force or comments and thoughts on uh, the problem statement and the discussion so far. Joe. I wanted to um, comment and follow up on Ramsey and Christine. You know, from the experience I have, from what I see in generated green and their waste, we actually at PBT began a program where we had an MRD that pursue CMD to become a feedstock. You know, um, the owners decided, you know, without a market, that feedstock becomes uh, a fill, but we're spending money to process it into a feedstock, but storing it. But we need an end market. 
that end market happens from customers that might have financing, might have permitting, but we've got to make all that smooth enough so that, yes, there's another industry out there that uses it, the feedstock, basically. That wasn't the case. So maybe it's a timing thing. Maybe it's a, um, the, the process of permitting these stuff, and then they'll quicken the timing. I don't know. But we have the fuel. We don't need to use oil. We can use CMD organic, basically, in the feedstock. And we did a lot of studies. We did a lot of data gathering to say that that becomes a, a better use versus the oil we import. We know that. But we decided from a business standpoint that, you know, maybe the timing is not that, that we have an end market for. It. So that being said, we can pursue that. However, let's make it easy on the end market side. You know, permit them, uh, make it faster, I don't know, uh, more efficient. Um, yeah, we know that this company is going to use the feed stars and give us energy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but it would make it easier for them. Maybe even help them on the financing side, make it easier for them to find the money to do that. Uh, but we were able to provide maybe 200 tons a day of feedstock to be able to be provided to these industry that can use it as fuel. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, that's basically my input. And I think that is useful. I think we should all consider that. It's just a matter of moving forward and making some of these obstacles happen. Great, thanks, Joe. Would you uh, clarify the exit on this, though, these end markets? Would they be locally based, or were you also looking at? Locally based. Okay. Because the clearly, there are other things that happen. Yeah. We have to ship it, right? And, and the piece starts to move towards the gasification industry mm -hmm. and the, the gasification used towards, right. you know, otherwise, we're importing the oil to provide that industry or uh, uh, service that industry. Right. I remember that you guys exploring that for quite some time and had the whole pick line and everything. And, yeah, and we even separated, we were able to use customers to tell them, you know, we can do this for additional cost, maybe very minor, but it's it's an additional course. And you know, with, with that in mind, our customers say, Yeah, we can do that. We already have an agreement or at least a, a buy in by the customers saying we can do that. Um, we all throw things away. We like it convenient when we throw things away. It's easier. But we can process that also. And we like to see the end market where we throw things, something's happening to what we throw away. You know, we don't just throw it away because we don't care. We think we can. Yeah. And if I have to um, use myself as an example, I believe that can work. Great. But, sorry, just the other thing is, the, the crux there was finding someone to use the feedstock yes. for gasification. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Any progress with that? Or? No. We, we, it's have to say we, we don't have that MRD process anymore. Yeah. yeah. But the process, the data collected, you know, almost five years of studies and all that is in place. So yes. if we have to uh, resurrect it. It can be. And, and is all that wood waste that you picked out in its own cell? Do I understand that correctly? It's correct. Um, that cell is valuable from a landfill standpoint. Uh, it's an airspace use. So we have been digging it out. We have been using it for other areas to be more efficient in our compaction. But that heat stock is no longer available. If you have an industry that can be open tomorrow, it won't be. Oh, to it's decomposed or what? It's just not available. We, we need to uh, use it for other places and all that. Oh, oh. Yeah, we've decided from a business standpoint to use what is in place. Um, we still can provide the process. It's just a matter of, you know, fixing the MRD, um, start doing it all over again. But again, we don't have the end market. You have to have the end market. Thanks, Joe. No, no, no. Thanks. Thanks for holding. I know you had a question or a comment. You're on mute. Yes, sorry. Um, that is a great discussion. And I think um, the end market plays major role in everything we do, correct? So I think if we could characterize um, the C and D to different baskets, we know as 
Christine had mentioned, some of it is going to be probably has no end market for it and is going to end up making it into the landfill. And that's probably a percentage of the CND that we could manage, but having the entire CND get directed to a landfill because we don't have an end market or usage for it, to me that's kind of takes away from the concept of you know, trying to minimize, divert, reduce, reuse, recycle without giving any incentive. So end market, you know, it'll be good to sit down and figure out for each county how much we produce and what type of material we produce. You could isolate the concrete, the wood, the rebars, um, the drywalls and et cetera into different categories and then concentrate on the ones that has the best end market. And if you have a cumulative tonnage from all counties within the state, it may be there is enough incentive for a private entity to contract with these, with all of us to get that commodity delivered so they can produce and deliver to that end market. Um, but we ought to do something. Doing nothing about CND and continue burying that stuff with the only CND facility is going to be um, we're going to lose that you know lose it because it's not going to be permitted. It just uh, to me it's unacceptable. Our landfills is very precious um, in value and to to just backfill it with concrete material and rebars and um, you know wood and drywalls uh, that we could put back in the market uh, it's more reasonable so that's that's my comment on that thanks Ramsey I appreciate that um, just a time time check we're at the bottom of the hour um, we're going to be going into our potential solutions discussion, but we want to catch uh, Christine and Nicole uh, first. Christine, you first, and Nicole right after. Nicole, Christine. I don't mind letting Nicole go first. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks. Um, I am concerned about leading into Schemes like gasification, which require consistent material input before we get really clear on the different bodies of C and D waste we're talking about. If it's truly waste that can't be reused in some other fashion, then maybe that's a body of material we're discussing um, for gasification. But if we're leaning into any time we take something apart, we're immediately selling it into a gasification system because that end market is going to pay the most um, versus ensuring that that material gets recirculated back into local construction projects. Um, that would be a concerning outcome to me. So I wanted to highlight that as we further explore gasification uh, as a solution. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Christine. Uh, yeah, special discussion about uh, refuse derived fuel or any of that, that would have to come way later because if we look at the hierarchy, we reduce, 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 you know, that's like way down the list. So um, the important thing for us to do is to look at ways that we can preserve the value of materials. Uh, characterization waste is good. So as a solution that I have there, um, they, it's way too early considering anything related to turning this into fuel. And uh, I can just tell you that among the many obstacles we would face on um, pursuing that path, you would get a very strong opposition from environmental groups, but also the EPA. Because all of this um, movement now, you know, the Biden Harris administration investing billions of dollars in climate production. So, 
Sorry, Christine, you're breaking up again. Um, and maybe the distance from your mic or some other. So right after Biden administration. Uh, they're investing billions of dollars in climate pollution reduction. C and D waste is high on their list. Uh, Hawaii, many of us are engaged in very competitive proposals to bring money for those programs to the state. And so uh, we are far, far, far away from any discussion about taking these materials and turning them into fuel. Okay, thank you. We've captured all that and we'd like to move on now to our solutions uh, conversation, potential solutions. We've got about 30 minutes to have that. Uh, so we'll turn that over to Tetra Tech. Thank you again, Ramsey. Next slide. Okay. So we're going to start the uh, potential solutions discussion with um, an intro to the baseline conditions of what's going on here in the U.S. So currently there are no nationwide CND bans implemented within the states. And although it's not being federally uh, regulated, some states and local governments have established uh, sea and waste disposal bans. Uh, most CMD in the U.S. is lawfully destined for disposal in landfills, regulated under Code of Federal Regulations 40, subtitles D and C. However, there are several opportunities for the beneficial reduction and recovery of these materials that would otherwise be landfilled. And there are also some cities with these construction ordinances, as you can see listed here. We'll, we'll cover a couple of those in the next few slides. Uh, the, resource re the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or RCRA, uh, states that CND waste operations must meet regulatory management required requirements for hazardous waste as uh, several components encountered are classified as RCRA hazardous waste. The Clean Air Act defines the EPA's responsibilities for protecting and improving air quality and includes provisions for the EPA to set national emission standards for hazardous air pollutants such as asbestos. And there are also some uh, federal regulations pertaining to asbestos management and education, as you can see here on the screen. Uh, the asbestos national emission standards for hazardous air pollutants regulations identify work practices to be followed regarding asbestos during demolitions and renovation um, and also has um, certain requirements um, to notify appropriate state agencies prior to any renovations. Uh, the Asbestos uh, Hazardous Emergency Response Act requires EPA to promulgate regulations requiring local educational agencies to ex inspect school buildings and implement asbestos response actions to prevent or reduce asbestos hazards. Uh, for the Asbestos Information Act, um, it supports uh, with providing transparency and identifying companies producing certain types of asbestos containing materials by requiring these manufacturers to report production to the US EPA. Some CND materials could also include asbestos and PCBs uh, that could affect uh, by other regulations that could be affected by other regulations, not just RCRA. Um, next slide. Um, I'd like to add that um, treated or wood waste in general, um, there is the majority of the wood waste that is generated through the deconstruction or demolition for the most part is treated in one way or another. And this is a result of um, local and federal building codes requiring uh, the treatment of such wood. And then um, just the protection of that wood by painting them or staining them. So they're all considered treated um, and have disposal uh, requirements. So with the increase in the awareness around sustainability and resource management, many countries have started exploring new models to minimize the use of limited resources. Uh, so the implementation of circular economy has emerged as a potential model to minimize the negative impact of CND waste on the environment. And here on the screen, we do have a couple of process flow diagrams of what that could look like. Next slide. Okay. 
So in terms of drivers of CND recycling, uh, we discussed the landfill in Maui that closed in 2016, as well as the PVT landfill here in Oahu that is expected to reach capacity in the next few years. Um, therefore, limited landfill airspace is a critical topic. Regarding LED or leadership in energy and environmental design, um, it is the most widely used green building rating system. Uh, the certification provides a framework for healthy, highly efficient, and cost-saving green buildings, which offer environmental, social, and governance benefits. Green buildings incorporate measures that are environmentally friendly and resource efficient across the building life cycle. And with that, we will now be uh, presenting on the uh, speaker for today's meeting, which is Quinn Vidim from Reuse Hawaii. So I will turn it over to Quinn. Awesome. Thank you, Sal. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to scoot over there just to, um, so I can see you guys better. I really appreciate you having me. Um, I'm part of the um, city and county uh, source reduction working group. And uh, boy, there's some real parallels here. So we should <laughs> we should connect the two groups and um, figure out kind of ways to um, collaborate on all this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm uh, Quinn Vidim, I'm executive director of Reuse Hawaii. Um, also the founder back in 2006. Um, and I've been, before that, I worked for five years in the Seattle area doing deconstruction, building material reuse. Um, grew up building houses with, with my dad in New England and um, have been, just been around this issue all my life. So it's great to see all this awesome conversation to figure out what the solutions are. Um, and uh, this is not a promotional talk. I wanted to share more about like what we do to inspire a solution. Uh, but I do want to give a little bit of framework for what Reuse Hawaii does. Um, and I know a lot of you have been in the room. Who's, who's been down to the Kaka'ako facility? Oh, yeah, you guys have. <laughs> Sorry, I missed you. Yeah. OK, cool. Um, so um, we're trying to build a circular economy through through our program. So we can go to the net, uh, actually two slides over. Oh. Um, Actually, back up. Okay. Oh, we're all scrambled up. Yeah, keep one more back, please. Sorry about that. And one more, maybe? Maybe. Oh, did we miss a, a couple? That was. I think the Hawaii waste crisis is the first slide is that we have. Oh, maybe our it's import so. went wrong. Okay, well. Uh, so our core program is deconstruction services as an alternative to conventional demolition. And uh, we have uh, crews that work in the field licensed and insured to do demolition. Instead of smashing buildings down, we deconstruct the buildings in the opposite order that they're built. This is just a proven method for maximizing recovery of reusable material. And I'll talk more about the, all the benefits that come along with this. Um, and then we have our redistribution model, which is basically a retail function, is until you get the material into the back end of the community, people are reusing it, you just haven't really fulfilled the mission. Uh, so that's a really big part. We serve 4,000 people at the Kaka'ako facility and also have a yard in Kona where people get material. Um, the, and then we also do uh, some other programs, tree milling, where are not finding a lot of trees get um, taken down and not necessarily repurposed in the best way. So we're making more resources out of uh, uh, trees that come down in storms. There's a lot of road work where trees come down, like the, the rail, for example, and um, and some conservation work of taking trees down. So a um, lot of opportunity to um, harvest locally produced material and uh, keep the carbon footprint of the building materials that we use down. Um, we also have a really important workforce development function. About a third of our staff come through a workforce development program. We partner with uh, different organizations for that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's been a 
really important piece as we talk about expanding the circular economy and needing people to do this work and needing to train them. Um, so as we all know, we're, there's a waste crisis here in Hawaii. It's, uh, it's uh, something that we, I think we all thought would maybe be further down the line and a couple years ago it kind of came to a head with the Land Use Commission uh, deciding not to allow PBT to expand and uh, Waimanoa Gulch needing to close and the landfill in Kekaha having issues and of course the stuff in Maui. So um, uh, I, I'm glad that we have a solution. I think there's a lot more, obviously a lot more work to do um, uh, moving forward. So we'll, next one, thanks. Thanks for being my clicker. Yeah, no, sorry we didn't have one. No worries. No worries. Okay. Um, so this is just, sorry, our, we exported from Canva to PowerPoint. This is what happens. Uh, didn't mean to throw the logo in the middle there. This is just a, a national uh, stat. And just to demonstrate how enormous C&D is as compared to the various mm -hmm. other waste streams, it's just a, a huge opportunity um, to divert material that um, is actually reusable um, and, uh, and recyclable in so many different uh, instances. Um, here in Hawaii, um, we've got our single wall houses. There's hundreds of houses every year that come down and they're built with old growth redwood and, uh, so, and also mm -hmm. old growth Douglas fir for the framing part. And so um, keeping that stuff out of the landfill is, is really important. It's, um, once you dispose of that old growth lumber, it's lost forever, right? Because they don't mill, um, thankfully, trees and the, they're all in protected forests now. So, all right, next one. So, um, Gisela, thank you for talking about the circular economy. Uh, we've been trying to educate on this as well. And uh, University of Hawaii put on a conference uh, last month. Um, which I thought was amazing. Um, 300 people showed up to talk about circular economy and connect it back to in indigenous cultures and technologies. And um, so we're just trying to get away from this linear economy where we extract material from the earth, manufacture goods and in, in factories, and then it's dumped. Um, and in some cases, there's like a planned obsolescence, right, where things break and get a lot of new things. So. Moving away from this to the circular economy, next slide. And there's a lot um, that goes into the circular economy, but we like to touch on this. Um, you know, the main thing that we do is keeping products and materials in use. So that's key. There's also uh, designing out waste and pollution. So uh, Giacella talked about the leadership and energy and environmental design, all these things that we can do when we think about how we're building new buildings to protect the environment. Uh, and then uh, regenerating natural systems that we can do through conservation work. Um, and the regenerating natural systems one is interesting. The next slide, thank you, is... Uh, Sorry. No, that, that's great. I just wanted to touch on Ajo Guaja because it's a great example of uh, the circular economy. Um, and so this is you know, thousands of year old technology, Native Hawaiian uh, way of living that uh, we have a lot to learn from. And so, yeah, can you get that? there it is. All right. Of course, Ramsey can share so much more about all this than, than, than I can, but, um, but it's a magical thing. And, um, and we want to uh, look at those systems and try and apply it to the complex world that we've we've created or messed up however you want to look at it <laughs> next slide so if you want to dig deeper into the circular economy oh wow this this really didn't okay well could be worse there's a at least there's a qr code and that will take you to the ellen macarthur foundation um, and they do a great job talking about circular economy you can kind of dig deeper and learn more about what it's all about. And I'm wondering if the QR code works. Did it take you? Works. Okay, cool, cool. Yep. Nice. So this is a uh, time lapse of a typical deconstruction. It gives a thousand words here. Uh, so. It might 
two-week project, typical single wall house, um, and uh, about five people working on site, taking the house part, the house apart in the opposite order that it was built. So the things that were put in last, we take out first, light fixtures, trim, um, then we get up on the roof and take the asphalt roofing off. Um, unfortunately, that can't be saved, but then the subroof and rafters and ceiling joists all get recovered. Um, and this is a you know single wall house, and it's as if they were thinking about deconstruction when they were building these single wall houses. Um, uh, no wall cavity, right? It's just TNG wall boards, and um, mm -hmm. comes comes apart really great um, with support from the uh, Pierre and Pen Omidyar. They helped us get that telehandler, which is crucial in moving the material around the site, and um, we also have to do a lot of denailing. It's a real big barrier to the deconstruction industry. It takes tons of time to pull the nails out, mm -hmm. out of the lumber. And, uh, so we do that back at our facility in Kakaako because you don't have time on site. Um, this house um, had an oak floor and you have to be really careful. There's lots of techniques and all this recovering the material so you don't damage it. This is your company? You this is us, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. This is in Kahala, yeah. And um, yeah, then usually this, the slab is left on site um, for whoever's coming in to build a new house. Sometimes they reuse the slab. Oftentimes it'll be taken up and sent to West Oahu aggregate. Um, so that's nice. We have a really great um, concrete recycling system here on Oahu, at least. I'm a little less familiar with uh, you know, other islands and what they do there. So, thank you, next slide. So, we like to talk about these six benefits of, of uh, deconstruction. Uh, the first is just obvious reducing waste, uh, but also the emissions um, from recovering all the embodied energy in building materials. So, like, we think about lumber a lot and um, when lumber is produced, you know, they build a road into the forest, truck the tree to the mill, mill the tree up, kiln dry it, plane it, and then ship it to its respective market. In our case, pretty far away, from, usually from where it's harvested. And so there's a ton of embodied energy in that building material. And so when we can recover, say, a two by four, we're not just keeping that material out of the landfill and making it a resource, but we're also preventing the need to, to uh, use a ton of energy to create a new one. Um, so in fact, the city and county uh, has been really gracious in giving us a grant based on our greenhouse gas emission, uh, emissions reductions. And so we weigh everything and report back to them. Um, affordable resources is really important. There's a big spectrum of different projects and needs in the community. Uh, we serve a lot of folks that maybe not, might not be able to afford brand new stuff. And so they come in to find appliances and cabinets and doors and windows, plumbing, electrical fixtures, uh, furniture, all kinds of stuff. Uh, in some cases, we uh, give it away. We have a free section. We also do uh, community give back campaigns when we do hotel projects because there's so much stuff like I'll call you all later and say anybody need a dresser you know, just because there's there's thousands of them and it's just like who needs this stuff is the main thing um, and so um, uh, it's really great to help people save money uh, last year we helped the community save 570,000 uh, compared to buying equivalent new material so that's an important one next slide uh, and then it's just preserving high quality lumber. Like I said, once it's demolished, it's lost forever. Uh, this is a great example of like, a, you know, old house in Kapuhulu deconstructed and put into the 28th floor of the first wine center, which is, I just thought it was a great example of redwood and oak floor. And then, um, giving a uh, second life um, uh, to the culturally significant material. Um, and these beams you see here are, this is the Patagonia store on Ward Avenue, and they mm -hmm. used um, 
beams from Word Warehouse deconstruction, which is coincidentally just a couple blocks away. So it's like a bioregional, you know, reuse of material. And it's just, it's the kind of look that you just can't reproduce if you were to use new material. So I love this shot too, because my son had a little cameo there. <laughs> Uh, so basic economics of deconstruction, everyone always wants to know how does it work, you know, because we're still a capitalist society that we really need to make the numbers work. And fortunately with deconstruction, it's awesome um, because homeowners, building owners get a tax deduction for the value of the salvage material. And uh, it can be tens of thousands of dollars. In fact, that uh, time lapse we saw was about a forty thousand dollar tax deduction, mm -hmm. um, and so basic economics here upfront costs are a little bit higher than demolition, but after you factor in the uh, the tax deduction, uh, you're actually saving. So um, yeah, it's a really great example of when you do something green it actually pays. Thank God, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, and then providing uh, employment and training opportunities, um, really important piece, you know, the University of Florida Center for Construction and the Environment did a study on this and found that deconstruction provides uh, at least five times more jobs as compared to demolition. In some projects that we do, it's actually much, much more. Uh, in fact, the Kona Village Resort project, we had 20 people for 10 months uh, just on one project compared to like a demolition. They just swoop through and it'd be done in no time. Uh, this is the crew at Princeville Resort um, working during the pandemic. So it was a great opportunity to train and employ. Um, currently, we, uh, we've had 70 or so participants working through 10 partner organizations. Great example is Kuku. They have the Kuku Aina Corps. So we have participants that come through there. This is a state funded program. And uh, folks get to learn about all the different aspects of the circular economy as it applies to the work that we use. Yeah, just uh, just working on equity issues with the um, with the employment uh, training and workforce development programs. Um, we actually have a focus with um, previously incarcerated people because there's tremendous barriers. Um, it's already hard coming out of prison, but then folks can't get a job, and then it's just it's a vicious cycle sometimes. And so um, we're supporting those folks. Turns out they're some of our best team members. So it's a, it's a real win-win. Next slide. Uh, then I, you know, I end with the tree milling here because it's, um, it's just a really awesome example of what we can do to innovate some, some new systems to produce locally um, harvested material. So, um, just uh, with support, I got to give my sponsors a plug. Kosasa Family Foundation and Hunt Development supported us in getting the program going a couple years ago. And um, these, these, these are great slabs, examples of what other millers actually don't want is Norfolk pine. No one wants to deal with it. So we take it and make cool stuff out of it. This is from Wahila Ridge. So people buy to make benches and countertops and all kinds of jazz. So. Next slide. So those are QR codes to our social media because it's really fun to just track what our team at Reeves Hawaii is doing. You can learn more about uh, the projects that we're up to, and, um, including stay tuned. We're about to mobilize into the Volcanoes National Park to mm -hmm. deconstruct the Okamura buildings and the Jaeger Museum up there. Mm -hmm. After the eruption in 2018, this is too unstable up there. They got to pull things back, and so we're helping um, helping with that. So um, happy to talk story, take questions. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Quinn. Appreciate it. Okay. Any quick questions for our guest? And you're from the task force. Yeah. yeah, we have about five minutes uh, before we go ahead and take our break. Andrew? Andrew? 
Yeah, I was. Thank you for the presentation, Quinn. That was very interesting. I was wondering. You said that you cannot recycle uh, the asphalt shingles. Is there a reason for that? I mean, I know there's programs on the mainland where you can turn it into certain things, cold, uh, hot patch, cold mix. Uh, is there a reason we can't do that here? Yeah, uh, well, it sounds like we're, you know, looking looking at that uh, in the legislature, at least with with road removal. But with like the composition tile and the pitching gravel, we there's no one on island that it, are, is working on recycling. Um, you know, I, one of the one of the reasons why we focus on reuse is because you don't need a recycling infrastructure. And you don't necessarily need the economies of scale that you would need with recycling. So, like when I worked in Washington State, there's um, uh, Recovery One in Tacoma, and they uh, you can carpet, drywall, asphalt shingle, um, all these things that we can't save that they can recycle because it's they're closer to where the gypsum, where the drywall plant is, right, and where where the carpet plant is, and uh, we looked into these acoustic tiles is a real problem. Um, there's tons of them downtown. They're just always coming out. And Armstrong, who produces them, um, the company Armstrong, um, the manufacturer, um, they have a recycling program, but we'd have to get it to um, Portland, Oregon. And crunching the numbers, you know, it's hard to convince the client to pay for that shipping. So especially with Honestly, especially with the tipping fees being so low, you know, it's like um, in Seattle, it's uh, it's like 100 plus per ton. What is it, Joe, now? Four dollars. No, I'm sorry. 72, oh. 74. Your MSW right now is 90 something, but our followers is 80. 80, yeah. I hope that helps. Thanks, Andrew. Any other questions? Uh, Ramsey, go ahead. Yeah, that, that is a great presentation, um, and I think it's great thinking, construct, deconstruct. Um, I'm just kind of curious, as far as the cost of your product after deconstruction, have you, I'm sure you've done that, but the comparison of cost going to Home Depot and Lowe's to purchase, uh, what are the difference? Because I know construction material is very expensive because we do live on an island and the cost of getting that material from the mainland or somewhere else is very, very expensive. Uh, our projects now coming at probably quadruple the cost of construction that we used to use back, you know, prior to COVID. So now construction costs is very, very, very expensive. So that's one question, I'm, you know, so if that proven to show that definitely uh, the deconstruction also have cost saving to the consumers, that would be great. In addition to that, um, I think counties and city and states, we probably need, I know Maui, for example, uh, you know, if and the county of Hawaii, we we get these fire breaks every so often, and I think some of that material could be utilized for fire breaks for road. You know, usually if you leave ten foot fire breaks, and you could use some of that recyclable material to lay it over that fire breaks. It could be gravel, concrete mixed with this asphalt shingles. That may create the market for it. And you guys probably could, you know, just crush it and mix it together and utilize it for fire breaks all over the state. That That is my comments. Thank you. Awesome. I think I heard a question in there about like the value, the cost comparison. So uh, with lumber, uh, we're about half of what it would cost to, to buy new lumber. And you know, so when we surveyed our customers a couple of years ago, the, the second 
uh, reason people come in is is to save money. The first is actually because they care about the environment. Which I thought it was great. Um, so, but it also depends. You know, there's uh, there if anyone needs jealousy glass, zero cost. It's free. So it's an interesting comparison. Um, yeah, and then you know, cabinets are always just awfully expensive if you buy them new. So it's another thing people are always um, looking at. And um, we used to just focus on building materials. A couple of years ago, we branched out to furniture, and that's another thing that's you know we did all took all the sofas from Princeville Resort. There was 250 sofas. We we're super nervous, <laughs> you know, because it's a lot of volume. And but we sold them for $125 each, and we, they're gone, you know, because the equivalent would be a thousand, you know, if you want to go buy a new one. So, Joe, I want to raise an issue on specs, standards, quality, legal aspects, uh, and I'm glad you brought that thing regarding that prints, all that furniture and all that. I had an experience where we had furniture, brand new, but not brand new, it was pretty close to new. But the only issue, and I think everybody remembers, it was the, uh, was the, it was contaminated with uh, new mold. Do mm -hmm. uh, you remember that? It was, it was at Wanda Gulch when I was a site engineer there, and they disposed of it because of mold. It was a legal aspect to that. I actually attended the meeting and said, Listen, people, are you going? Are you be willing to give it out to the public free? No, because there's legal issues. They might get sued. Blah blah blah. So that's something that I'm thinking about. That sure, you can reuse, you can recycle, you can give it away. But then our lawyers get. I don't have anything against lawyers, but don't get into the end. And and rightfully so, because yeah, the the safety, the the health aspects, all that comes into play. So with reuse Hawaii, is that something you guys consider or something? Yeah, I mean, you have to look at the condition quality of the material. We, we've not run into the mold stuff in the furniture, so that's good. But, um, you know, always watching out for our, our processors inspect for termite damage. Usually it's damaged, termites are gone, but, you know, want to make sure there's not you know, yeah. hollow parts of the lumber. Um, you know, there's also, um, you know, there's going to be a measure in the legislature around um, the asbestos for for, um, for residential um, houses because right now there's no no regulation on it. There is great systems for commercial, but um, so um, we have abatement zone on all of our projects, but you got to keep keep a lookout for certain things that might have ACM asbestos containing materials. So. Yeah, always, you know, just got to, you know, pay attention to what we're taking in. We have pretty, pretty clear acceptance policy on our website, too, to kind of make sure we're not taking in PCB ballast and all that kind of stuff. Great. Thanks, Quinn. We'll take one more question um, or comment, Christine, and then we'll go into our break. I'm going to get into solutions more, but I thought I would just throw in the comment about um, experience was at Reuse Hawaii. When I worked for Senator Laura Casio, we went straight there to outfit our office and found a lot of good sports and we're happy to contribute to Quinn. And I just want to thank Quinn for all the really good work he does. And hey, Christine. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Quinn, thank you for your presentation today. No problem. Uh, let's take a quick break and we will return in. We'll return at 10 20. 10 20. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Can you hear me or not?
Hi everyone. I didn't realize it was you. Can you guys hear me? <clears throat> we can't hear on the owl. Sunny, we're yeah. hearing you. Okay, perfect. Sorry, we just weren't, I wasn't hearing anything on the owl, so I was nervous. Okay. Nope. Awesome. Nope. We're getting the ambient sound and your voice now. Good. Okay, wonderful. Good, good, good. Awesome. Thank you all for such a robust discussion so far, and we hope to keep it up through the end. And we are now going to move into our comparative analysis. Thank you, Sunny. Next slide. And we can go to the next one again. So we are looking into the five potential solution categories that were originally identified at the beginning of this meeting. So starting off with extended producer responsibility. So manufacturers, recycling companies, and contractors can reduce the amount of CND waste going into landfill. Uh, one way is to encourage collaboration by awarding LED credits for using products covered by manufacturers' EPR programs. Uh, these take-back programs encourage manufacturers and builders to take a more proactive role in environmental impact of their products, particularly when it comes to end-of-life management. Uh, so here we have an example of a flowchart from Trimtex Drywall Products in Illinois. Uh, it's a company that offers a product take-back program for trim scraps and non-modified or clean Trimtex products that have reached the end of life of their cycle. And these scraps can be reused in the production process, diverting materials from the landfill. And the program helps projects achieve the LEED uh, V4 building product disclosure and an optimi optimization source of raw materials credit through EPR. And certain manufacturers, for example, interface include 30 third party verification of their EPR programs through Green Circle, creating additional useful documentation. Um, among different materials that we've researched for take back programs here in the states uh, we've found a few for ceiling tiles and carpet um, and so those are among some of the materials that accepted that are accepted through take back programs here in the u.s and i also just wanted to note that we will have a separate task force meeting to discuss carpet in greater detail mm -hmm. Next slide. For resource reduction alternatives, um, we want to encourage the support of local reduce and reuse alternatives. So for example, deconstruction workshops. Um, also somewhat related to uh, outreach and education, uh, the state of Hawaii has developed a CND waste management guide um, that stated uh, April 2013. If you would like to review that document, um, feel free to scan the QR code and it'll take you straight to that management guide. We also have, wait, sorry, I'm gonna go back. Here you go. We're just giving everybody a few seconds to scan the QR code. Mm -hmm. So here on the next slide, we have a list of alternatives to traditional building materials. Uh, so bamboo is a renewable resource that grows much faster than traditional hardwoods, and that makes it a desirable material for sustainable architectural design and construction. It's also suitable for improved alternatives to conventional concrete and steel and has a high strength to weight ratio that can be carved and molded. Um, it's also lightweight, durable, and versatile, making it um, a great alternative for various construction applications. Green roofs are another alternative to conventional roofing materials, and they also provide several benefits, including uh, reduction of temperatures, uh, as well as energy consumption by lowering the demand for air conditioning to buildings. Some other benefits include the reduction and filtration of stormwater runoff, 
observation, absorption, filtration of CO2 and pollutants, and in some cases can also even serve as a recreational green space for the community to use. Hempcrete is another construction building material, and that consists of hemp shives um, and a couple other uh, aggregates, water. Um, and this is this can be used to support um, a frame and does not have um, requisite strength for a constructing foundation. It has low mechanical properties and low thermal conductivity, making it ideal for insulation materials. It's also suitable for use in earthquake prone areas and is resistant to cracking under movement. Although hempcrete is not known for its strength, it does provide a high vapor permeability that allows <coughs> for metal control of temperatures in buildings. Uh, cork is also another renewable resource that is harvested from cork oak trees, and it naturally regenerates after harvesting. And this material can be used as an insulation material, as well as for flooring and wall coverings and exterior wall cladding. It's also extremely waterproof and resistant to abrasion and acts as a fire retardant. And it can also regulate uh, humidity as well. Um, for mycelium, uh, the root structure of fungi, um, that can also be used uh, to create biodegradable and lightweight construction materials, specifically for flooring, wall covering panels, and insulation as well. Rammed earth construction involves the compression of natural raw materials such as chalk, lime, or gravel to create durable walls. Um, it also has um, high thermal mass allowing for heat absorption and storage and um, making it energy efficient as well. Uh, we also wanted to highlight uh, indigenous building materials and construction techniques using local materials as another alternative to uh, traditional building materials. In the next slide, we have some visual examples of other materials that we discussed in the previous slide. Um, also just wanted to point out that AI is being used to suggest sustainable alternatives to traditional building materials, and this reduces reliance on resource intensive options. The use of recycled and locally sourced materials can be optimized through AI algorithms, reducing waste and transportation costs as well. Now going into education and outreach opportunities, the US EPA has publicly accessible educational resources, and this includes a design for deconstruction manual as well as a residential deconstruction manual. These manuals provide guidance on designing buildings to facilitate the deconstruction of buildings, as well as reducing the disposal of reusable CND materials. The US EPA also has a deconstruction rapid assessment tool, um, which will aid in prioritization of structures for deconstruction and salvage, as well as decision making for time allocation and resources. Uh, we also wanted to mention uh, the city and county of Honolulu. Uh, they do offer free tours known as Tour de Trash, and these tours are designed to educate the public on solid waste management, as well as the implementation of sustainable practices. Uh, here we have ex an example in the image of one of the Tour de Trash tours specific to CND. Um, and I also wanted to mention that there was a CND recycling tour that was scheduled for fall of 2023. Um, and that uh, workshop was to highlight construction companies that are implementing ways to create less waste, as well as reuse construction debris. Uh, however, the tour was uh, canceled, but uh, there are opportunities to host additional tours in the future specific to CND. <laughs> For the 2024 Tour de Trash lineup, uh, the city is updating its website. If you go to honolulu.gov slash opala and type in Tour de Trash in the search box, uh, within the next few weeks, uh, the uh, 2024 tour offerings will pop up. Usually there's five or six a year. 
And I can follow up with our recycling branch and find out if there'll be a C and D um, recyclers and processors for um, offer um, for this year. Okay, thank you. What was the link again? Honolulu.gov backslash Opala? That's right. Okay, awesome. I'll just send that in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so going back to education and outreach opportunities, um, getting more specific into what some other cities or counties are doing. So the city of San Antonio held its first ever certified deconstruction contractor training in October of 2019, and they now offer this training every year. The training is a five day hands on field course, and it includes two virtual sessions on permitting and introductory business operations. It also focuses on transferring essential skills for hands on deconstruction. And this includes, for example, proper tools and worksite organization, assessment of materials for reuse and material conditions, methods for removing materials in a matter that allows them to be reused, site preparation and material storage as well as an introduction to business operations for deconstruction and salvage. We also have the County of San Mateo in California. Their Office of Sustainability offers uh, a free deconstruction training from the Reuse Institute. And participants who graduate from the program receive certificates and are also eligible to be listed in the company's database of available deconstruction workers. And this specific training is a bit longer. It's a 12 day course and it ranges from classroom instruction to field training, including deconstructing a house. And the county has also developed a construction, deconstruction and demolition guide, as you can see here on the screen. And that contains information related to deconstruction, salvage and reuse, city CND recycling requirements, hazardous and universal waste, as well as an FAQ and a list of haulers and CND sorting facilities. And we also have a video to uh, present on the deconstruction training that occurs in the city of San Antonio. And we are conducting a deconstruction training program in partnership between the Office of Historic Preservation and the San Antonio River Authority's property here. I think it's, it's an awesome experience. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, as far as uh, resalvaging wood. It's going to be beneficial to us. The tools, the knowledge that they've been sharing with us, you know, taking us out. You know, I never imagined we could take a roof off from the attic out. You know, I, I was, when I got up there and started doing it, I was like, wow, okay, you know, so. It's been a real experience. A lot of knowledge has been poured out and knowledge that we could take back and, and use for our stores and for anybody else that's out there, you know, that uh, wants to do this kind of stuff. I'm new at this. And so just working with the material, it, it almost has a, a life of itself. Like when you're trying to pull a board off, it's almost like it doesn't want to leave home, but it has to because otherwise it's going to go in a dumpster. And we're also saving the environment by not having to cut down trees and throwing good material in the landfill. What we see is that a portion of our materials is going right back into the buildings, and then another portion is going into craft materials and craft goods, home goods, things which will be cherished, a family table that you'll sit around for generations, heirloom items. These are really beautiful materials, and often they're best served by being uh, accessible, touchable, visible. For folks who are interested in getting involved, there's a million ways to do so. And you don't have to swing a hammer to get involved in deconstruction. We need people at every level, working in policy, working in advocacy, education, business. Get in touch with the OHP. Your Office of Historic Preservation is going to be hosting many trainings just like this one. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so City of San Antonio is doing quite a bit on deconstruction and, and conducting a deconstruction training program in partnership. Next slide. Yep, we just didn't want to leave that video. I wanted to watch it again. Okay. Uh, so here's an example of um, additional efforts oops, from the City of San Antonio. Um, one second. Mm -hmm.
I'm just waiting for the slide to load up. Oh, there it is. Uh, so each year, City of San Antonio hosts what they call a solar fest. And uh, at one of these events, they had a tabling event specific to C&D. Um, this was in November, and they also had um, a tabling area where they were using um, recycled wood to make um, ornaments, since this was in November. And then they also even created a um, mascot or a turkey made out of salvaged C&D, as you can see here on the screen. Um, so that was pardoned from the landfill. And even the mayor showed up to this event. And as you can see here on the red box, I'll just read it out. It says, solar festival organizers have agreed to the pardoning of the wood turkey constructed from reclaimed building materials known as Sally the Salvaged Turkey and remind, or to remind us of the role we all play in achieving waste reduction goals. So regarding government programs and subsidies, the US EPA has recently announced the availability of $100 million in grant funding for fiscal year 2024. And this is to support businesses that manufacture construction materials to develop and verify environmental product declarations, as well as states, Indian tribes, nonprofit orgs that will support these businesses. And this specific program seeks to improve transparency and the disclosure of embodied greenhouse gas emissions, data associated with CND materials and products to facilitate the procurement of lower embodied carbon construction materials and products. Uh, the US EPA has also allocated $275 million in funding towards the Solid Waste Infrastructure for Recycling Grant Program. And this specific program provides funding towards the implementation of the National Recycling Strategy to improve post-consumer materials management and infrastructure, support improvements to local post-consumer materials management, and recycling programs uh, that support local waste management authorities in making improvements to uh, local waste management systems. Uh, in California, uh, we have the, the uh, California Green Building Standards Code. Um, so this specific code requires all permitted new construction to divert a minimum of 50% of CND waste generated as part of the project. Um, it also um, requires a 50% diversion from CND waste generated from alterations. Um, and it also uh, requires all or new major renovated state buildings uh, to meet the LED um, requirements or certification or higher. Um, and then we already mentioned it before, but these certification programs promote a whole building approach to sustainability. For example, sustainable site development, water and energy savings, as well as material selection. Um, still pertaining to California, Senate Bill 1374 seeks to promote CND materials diversion by requiring CalRecycle to develop and adopt a model for CND diversion ordinance for voluntary use by uh, California jurisdictions. Specifically, CalRecycle was directed to adopt one or more model ordinances suitable for modification by a local agency. Um, CalRecycle adopted this model back in March of 2004. It has sis since been updated to reflect the Cal Green waste management requirements. In Seattle, Washington, individuals may be required to apply for a new building permit prior to deconstruction. And there are certain requirements that must be met uh, in order to obtain this permit. So for example, um, they must reuse a minimum of 20% of building materials by weight, recycle or reuse a minimum of 50% of building materials, as well as recycle or reuse 100% of asphalt, brick, and concrete. Um, those who wish to get a permit must also submit a waste diversion plan, 
and a waste diversion report that identifies the actual rates of salvaged and recycled materials once the deconstruction is completed. And then we briefly uh, talked about San Antonio as well. So they have a deconstruction and circular economy program. Um, and they're working to develop interdisciplinary community focused uh, policies and partnerships in order to advance uh, building materials recovery um, and reuse as well. In September of 2022, the San Antonio City Council also adopted their very first deconstruction ordinance requiring small scale housing stock um, built prior to 1920 or 1945 to be deconstructed by a certified deconstruction contractor rather than having it be demolished. And then these contractors must also complete a deconstruction contractor training as a prerequisite to the certification. Portland, Oregon became the first city in the country to implement a deconstruction law, and this was back in 2016. And since then, other cities, including Palo Alto in California, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin have also adopted their own deconstruction laws. In Nashville, Tennessee, there's also proposed legislation for a commercial construction and demolition materials ordinance. And this would amend the existing solid waste code by creating a comprehensive plan to minimize economic disruptions and uncertainty due to lack of CND disposal options, as well as increased capacity to manage materials locally, encouraging growth of the region's options for CND recycling and recovery, stabilizing costs for CND materials management by encouraging local and regional long-term solutions, and reducing reliance on landfill disposal for CND uh, materials as well. <clears throat> For the last solutions category, we have free market solutions. So we um, also had Quinn present on what Reuse Hawaii is doing. Um, we also wanted to mention um, recycled aggregate. Um, as a free market solution, which is typically produced by crushing concrete, sometimes asphalt. Um, and while it has many uses, the primary market for this is a uh, road. Uh, the use of recycled aggregate can save money, create additional business opportunities, save energy, especially if recycled on site. Um, and then helps conserve resources and local governments meet their diversion goals. Options for recycling of CND debris differ obviously by material types. Um, concrete is often crushed with portable crushers and is reused on site or delivered to recovery facilities. Asphalt paving companies incorporate cold plain asphalt back into their virgin mix to um, up to state allowed limits. And in Oahu, there are some paving companies that also accept waste from roads and parking lot demolitions. And they crush this material or sell it for use in highway underlayment or base. In Kauai and Maui, some private nurseries also accept new drywall and incorporate it into their compost or soil amendments. And all islands have facilities for recycling clean wood waste, um, often by grinding and incorporating it into composting operations. Uh, all islands also have outlets for recycling uh, metals, and because recyclers pay for scrap metals, there's also an economic incentive for the recovery of these metal scraps. <clears throat> um, other free market solutions not listed in here. Um, the state does have multiple operations on our facilities that receive segregated um, inerts for the, for the most part. So those are well taken care of. Um, a free market solution could be the uh, siting and permitting a, of a mixed or commingled CND recycling facility and even potentially um, the siting and permitting of an additional uh, CND landfill. Thank you. Is that good? Mm -hmm. 
All right. Thank you for the presentation and information. Uh, as always, we now turn to our community members, guests, and public who are on the call. We give you an opportunity to please share your thoughts on the information presented. Uh, if there's a focus question, it might be this. What opportunities would you like to encourage to enhance the management of CND materials? So the floor is now open. If you have a thought, please raise your hand and make a comment. Yeah, yeah. These are guests of materials. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. sure. Um, just uh, an update. The, there's a model in some communities, including Hawaii Island, where uh, there's a collection site with transfer stations um, to give residents an option to donate material as opposed to dumping it uh, in the pit. And um, so the city council approved uh, last year a um, pilot project at Kapala Quarry Transfer Station. Uh, it's going to be a five month uh, project taking in uh, build, building materials, but also household stuff. That'll all be going to Goodwill Industries. And um, we're, we're, we, um, Reuse is doing the pilot project, but it could be operated, you know, going forward, it could be operated by anyone really. Um, so we'll keep everyone posted on the report with that because it could be a sort of a low hanging fruit, right? To just have at the major transfer stations have a collection site itself. Great, thanks, Quinn. Anyone else? <clears throat> Feel free to drop your comments in the chat as well at any point in time. Not seeing any. Uh, Nicole. Hi, uh, thank you for that awesome presentation and Quinn for your presentation earlier as well. Uh, in general, I'm way more excited about um, solutions that have enforceability and teeth versus maybe some more passive educational programs. I see having been in this movement for a long time, even those of us with the best intention and the most education around a topic often need boundaries in order to act in the best interest of the planet and our community. Um, instead of prioritizing what's easy and efficient or is going to make the most money for our business idea. So I just want to highlight that I'd love to see um, yeah, more discussion and thought work around enforceable policies we could propose through the state. Um, and again, just a shout out to the power of what groups like Reuse are doing to harvest incredible resources like old growth redwood and redistribute it. And that I'd love to see us do everything we can to prevent those resources from going into any kind of um, refuse derived fuel project and instead be recirculated in the community because it's incredibly impactful. Uh, and I think one more thing I'll add there is, is exploring some kind of quota for both the construction and the demolition end where you know, maybe we're proposing an ordinance that says all construction projects of know, commercial construction projects of X size must have 10% reused materials. And then that graduates to 20 and then the same on the demolition end. Uh, I think that would be impactful. Thank you, Nicole. Christine. Where do we start? I mean, we could discuss the topic for days, and uh, that's one of the recommendations is that we find ways to have more deeper conversations. Um, this is a real priority for the EPA. Anyone that's tracking this EPA, like greatly, they are so so interested in supporting any kind of innovation around the recovery of some of the materials of waste. So we would be really smart, regardless of what ends up with the integrated power waste management plan, just as individuals engaged in this industry area, to start working together to try to access some of that funding. We have an application. 
Christine, somehow we're missing, we're, we're, you're dropping out again, so we keep missing some things, so. Okay, uh, I'll snug up a little more. Um, Thank you. Lots and lots of opportunities around the uh, Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. We have an active do they get access to an intermediate like set up they Christine, uh, unfortunately, Christine, unfortunately, we know you're saying some wonderful things we want to hear, but we're not getting, we're getting every other word. So maybe, do you have a fan or something that's going, but it seems no. to be interrupting your transmission. I don't, but I can hear somebody typing, like transcribing as I'm oh, speaking. Okay, maybe that, all right, we'll cut that, we'll cut back and wait until you finish. Go ahead. That might be it. Go ahead. Okay. So it's all about access and how do we give access, how do we give the people who can make use of these materials access to that? Do we do it through an intermediary like um, UCYE or do we set up some kind of system on site? That could be determined. But number one thing, talking to Ramsey here, talking to all the county people, don't give them any kind of exemption. Um, I, been pressure lately saying oh you could bring down the cost of housing if somehow you made it cheaper for us to get rid of construction and demolition waste uh, ole that is the incentive for them to divert materials so you know maybe you could give an incentive like okay if they reached a 70 percent diversion goal then you would charge them less cost of housing for the remaining 30 percent but um, that the market not downstream uh, the market we need to create is pictures that can show that beautiful reception area uh, at the one of the most yeah. well, this is task force group anyway, so. Um, together, more often, um, um, Ramsey and actually Quinn and I did do a little experiment. We got together with one major construction company here. It didn't really go anywhere, but honestly, what needs to happen is that people like me and Cole and Quinn, we need access to these construction and demolition sites. We need to be able to get what we're doing, share ideas, and ask in an office someplace to do what we're doing now, but actually like boots on the ground task force to get in there because I am convinced if we were to share information and really see each other's world, that that would help. Um, the state did get a Swiffer grant. Uh, Hawaii County got a Swiffer grant. So there's something in that Swiffer grant that was about a needs assessment. And whether that relates to this specifically or um, something else that the this task group is doing, if one of the consultants can look in the uh, look into that, like what exactly is the state doing um, for that Swiffer grant? That would be helpful information to us. Um, and uh, here's another question for Ramsey. Um, I thought at one point Hawaii County had a requirement that if you were going to do construction uh, or demolition, that you had to go to the county with a sort of a waste plan. And if we don't have that, then that is definitely something we should do how that relates to the state. Maybe it's a recommendation by the state. Um, yep, and and anytime there's a construction or demolition project over a certain value, there should be a requirement to cons consult with deconstruction experts, but also bioremediation experts, because let's not forget, 
when these major sites are deconstructed or demolished or whatever, the soil underneath is very likely to be contaminated. And we do not want these companies to come in, scrape up all that soil and take it to the landfill. So as you can see, there's lots and lots and lots to think and talk about around this. And if there is some way that we can create um, a, a system or a program for us sharing this kind of information and gaining access to construction and demolition sites, to me, that would be the most helpful thing we could do. our conversation and again uh, in this case a question we're looking at is what opportunities for improvements to CND management would you suggest and of course this is a great conversation so far thanks Christine anyone else we got a hand who is it Ramsey Ramsey yeah thank you um, you know, we, Christine, to answer your question, the county does have that provision within our code. The challenge is uh, the market for it and the vendors that do exist on the island that wanted to take it. So, and I think that's kind of loop back to our earlier discussion when we started this. You know, the end market, how could we, um, create opportunities or incentives to allow um, vendors to come in and start a business of CND facilities without going through the permitting of solid waste permits. So we need to rebrand um, these type of facilities to have more of them on each island so we could start diverting that C and D material th through construction. Uh, like I said, if you think of it as different baskets and you characterize the, uh, the material that get created based on project specific, but if, if the state, us and the experts here in the meeting could identify because construction demolition is pretty much known, right? You're dealing with um, either wood, concrete, drywalls, asphalts, um, whatever, whatever product that um, comes through deconstruction or demolition. Usually people look at the dollar figure. The reason they opt to use demolition is because like you've seen from the presentation, it's cheaper for them than going through deconstruction. So how can we make more incentive to be able to start deconstructing rather than going straight to demolition? So we need to either increase the cost of just landfilling, because if you're going to go ahead and demolish it without deconstructing it, then we need to increase the cost that comes to our landfill. So maybe that give them more incentive now to to think twice about bringing it to a landfill. But I don't know politically how that's going to work. But but I think we need to either do a, a state mandate so or a county mandate. It could be each county, but I think we need to get supported by the state. Um, there's, you know, the hazard waste, um, you know, we have a line, line landfill, so we could handle special waste that cannot be recycled. Um, and we're going to see more of these demos. Um, the reason I'm saying I'm, we as a county got a upcoming project, uh, for the wastewater and we're going to have demolition. But yeah, we're going to put incentive to the contractor to follow the county code. But still, we need to have more markets up here within each county. Uh, we need to set incentives. We need to 
strategically work with the state on improving the process and the permitting process. That even goes to composting. I know you guys presented the compost, but how many certified composter we have in the state? Because I keep hearing that it's very rigorous to get a composting permit. So if we cannot streamline the process to drive um, companies and vendors to come and start opening more businesses to become competitive, we're kind of defeating the purpose. So, um, you know, that's that's my take. We we definitely have a lot of work ahead of us, and I just breaks my heart to see that the only C and D, even with this, when I was in the city and county, I knew of it when the law. I forgot the, the bill that was passed, I think is 73. That kind of, if you build facility within uh, uh, conservation districts, then, you know, certain distance, then you cannot re-permit it and what have you. I understand the purpose for it, but uh, we need to encourage issue and permit in certain areas, but, you know, the that allow for better environmental protection. I think I spoke too much. I know I keep going in that topic forever, but I'm gonna leave it to somebody else to talk. But it's you you guys see me, I get passionate when I talk about it because it's just I don't want to end up um you know throwing things environmentally that you know we could we could divert. Thanks. Sunny, the owl is muted right now. So if Ramsey is um, taking us into the next um, convo. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, Ramsey, could you just repeat what you said? Oh, okay. Yeah, we just thank everyone. I ask continued uh, input from our task force members. We do have a comment from. Yeah, I'd like to add on uh, programs, policies, uh, facilities, and whatnot. So. It seems like in, in, in materials management, we're sometimes um, end up with situations of what comes first, the chicken and the egg story. So um, in order to promote the C&D uh, recycling, uh, many jurisdictions have implemented ordinances. These ordinances require a certain amount of diversion. There needs to be facilities that are able to um, divert that material, um, which then are identified by the jurisdiction, which has the ordinances, says um, you must divert this much and you must take it to these certified facilities. So what come first is very difficult, but it seems like both items would be needed at the same time. So that's just uh, an observation and it does occur and we're currently going through that situation for organics management in California. Uh, ordinances requiring the diversion of organics and there are not being enough facilities to divert that um, organics or not enough composting or anaerobic digestion facilities. I see the same situation here. If one wants to um, divert more CND, uh, there needs to be an ordinance, but then there is also need a facility which the the facility then needs markets also uh, to make it um, feasible. So just wanted to add that, that there is sort of a quandary that that comes along with any type of future policy or regulation. Thank you. Thanks, Azar. We have Christina and Nicole. Okay, Christina and Nicole. I just want to check on the others uh, real quick. Uh, Dominic, we haven't heard from you today. If there's anything you have to offer, um, and I think Andrew, I Andrew, I think you asked the question earlier, but let's go ahead with uh, who was up first. Uh, Christine, go ahead. So 
as we're thinking about these things, we have to be really innovative and not just trying to take things that came out of the take make waste paradigm and then fit them in you know, like, oh, that's not going to work. So when it comes to diversion of waste and access, there's a lot that can be done in the informal sector is what we call it. And we can work with groups like Men of Pa'a. I don't know if you know them, but this is a group that works with men exiting the criminal justice system. And there's a lot of people who would like to have access to these materials. Um, and so that is a starting point if we want to, you know, deal with chicken and egg issues um, on a longer time frame. But I know there's an immediate need for people in a lot of the um, less affluent communities on our island and certainly on other islands and then possibly also on Maui, you know, where people are scrambling to create um, housing. And so there's a lot that can be done there. And the way to make that work and not get stuck in this kind of traditional capitalistic economic model is to look at different grant opportunities. So what amount of money is being spent right now to hire C&D waste to you know, a temporary site? And then was there an opportunity when someone went to get the money to do that to create some of these innovative programs and say, OK, we're going to model this other way of handling these materials. From where I sit, Recycle Hawaii, we see these opportunities popping up left and right all the time. And again, no chicken, no egg before any of that. More focused discussions between people like those on this call today, figuring out logistics would be very, very helpful. And there, the money to model these new systems is out there. We would just need to be clear about what we want. So I think Department of Health could easily sponsor, maybe even Recycle Hawaii or Zero Waste Oahu or whatever, more in-depth discussions like this because we will definitely come up with plans and logistics that don't even require ordinances. Um, not to say that we shouldn't do legislation. I agree with Nicole that you know, you do have to kind of set things, especially for bigger projects, you know, in the permitting requirement. But there's so much that can be done. And so this is the last time I am going to say, how can we get together more and discuss this, um, this whole issue? Nicole, Nicole, go ahead. Oh, there you go. Thanks. Um, just a quick comment to the kind of chicken and the egg situation we find ourselves in oftentimes. I think if we do take on initiatives or policies that have diversion requirements, instead of getting caught up in, you know, do we have everything perfectly set up yet, we can allow for that transition to happen by creating a phased approach. Um, I also wanted to highlight that the city and county of Honolulu has an ordinance now requiring um, residential food waste diversion out of our trash cans. And uh, when that ordinance was passed, there was no facility to which that material was mandated to go. So th there is sometimes a leap of faith that I think we need to be comfortable with taking. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would care to add anything at this time? We have a few more minutes uh, in the subject. Otherwise, we can move forward. Whose hand is that? Oh, Ramsey, Ramsey go ahead. Yeah, well, one more thing uh, maybe I could add. Um, I'd imagine we could access the state database on imports and exports. Um, and then probably once we understand the, the high demands of product, and maybe we could start uh, branding that product and encouraging the reuse or rediversion of that product itself. So is that something possible to 
to do through the group to understand what is the most used product here in the state that causing out of the CD, C and D that potentially will have a high impact. And maybe if we could focus on these type of products and allow the market to build with them, uh, maybe that's that's one direction. I don't know, I'm just thinking outside the box. Thank you, Ramsey. Does anyone care to give that a shot? If not, we encourage you to continue sharing your thoughts. Who we have? Nicole, go ahead. I love that idea. And a couple years ago, I was commissioned to try and do a net plastics inventory for the state, um, not by the state, but looking at what's coming in and out of the state of Hawaii. And I learned that getting access to that detailed information of product flow is close to impossible. Um, after like about a year of trying. So I love the idea and I would love to talk with anybody who wants to figure that out because we found it pretty impossible. Thank you, Nicole. Christine. I forgot to acknowledge whoever um, included information about alternative building materials at the beginning that my heart just sung when I saw that and people talking about that because upstream innovation is really where we need to be if we're going to build a new economy. That's the kind of things. So thank you very much to whoever included that. And um, I don't think we should be ignoring that in all this discussion about waste. Excellent. Thank you for that. Ramsey, I just had one thing. Sure, go ahead, council. please, go ahead. Um, so legislation's come up a bunch. Gail mentioned Senate Bill 2436, introduced by Miley Shimabukuro, Senator. Um, take a look. It uh, requires 20% uh, construction waste diversion from all projects and then 25% for public works jobs. But she also is introducing Senate Bill 2437, which um, prioritizes um, bidders that are committed to waste reduction during the procurement process. So um, two things to track for those that are um, interested in the legislative stuff, which seems like a critical piece to all this. I can't just count on altruism. Got um, to gotta have some policy in place that steers things. Good point, thank you. Did everyone get those numbers? Did you get? I got 20% diversion of construction waste from all projects, and then 25% from public works projects. Yeah, um, not with the what bill was numbers. the bill number though? That's uh, Senate Bill SB 2436. Okay. And then the one related to procurement is Senate Bill SB 2437. Related to procurement. Okay, thank you. And then these are both proposed um, during the current session. Yeah, they were just they just been just adopted. So okay. Yeah, check Perfect. it out. Is it two four three six or six three? Three six. Thank you. Okay. Good input. Thanks. Great. <clears throat> okay. Do we have any other? Uh, Great ideas, by the way, coming in. Uh, any other thoughts and comments that our, our consultants can look at and consider putting into the report? OK, if not, we're going to suggest that we perhaps move forward to our meeting summary. Um, are we prepared for that? All right. All right. Thank you, Ramsey, and thank you all. Um, so we're just going to take this, these next few minutes to wrap up some of the potential solutions that task force members and the public have brought up throughout the course of today's uh, meeting. So things that I've heard, um, soil remediation needs to be included um, when it comes to CND management. 
um, as well as enforcement for a requirement of um, consultation with deconstruction and bioremedial experts prior to any construction and demolition activities. I also heard um, there's lots of waste in CND that is not marketable, so we need to look at waste to create grades of materials, source separation. Uh, we also discuss needing to uh, get away from a linear economy and focusing on a circular economy in order to keep products and materials in use. Uh, we also discussed siting and permitting of a mixed co mingle CND facility or a landfill, um, as well as facilitating the permitting process for CND landfills and providing funding to support the development, um, as well as uh, CND facilities, so not just landfills. Uh, we also discuss the use of CND for gasification as a last resort and ensuring recirculation of CND prior to exploring gasification as an option. We've discussed supporting deconstruction and reuse of CND materials to reduce emissions and increasing the cost of CND materials landfilling in order to encourage deconstruction. We've also discussed um, the need for centralized collection sites for various CND materials at transfer stations. And we also highlighted the importance of enforceable policies um, for proposal to the state. We've also discussed the enhancement of accessibility for reusable CND materials to the public, as well as seek seeking grant opportunities such as the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant and SWIFR Grant to look at what the state is doing with these grants. Uh, regulations to set CND diversion requirements was also discussed, as well as providing financial incentives for meeting these diversion goals. We also talked about um, the need for continued discussions among task force members for uh, CND management, as well as focusing on markets for common CND materials. We also highlighted um, the importance of upstream innovation um, based on the different resource reduction alternative options that were presented earlier in this meeting. So if there's anything I missed or something that someone else wants to add on, please feel free. Task Force members. Andy. Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, just stress again those alternative materials. So maybe as part of any ordinance that deals with deconstruction and the percentage of materials that have to be, you know, either reused um, coming out of a project or going into a new project, we may want to have some sort of percentage of uh, alternative materials to try and reach a goal of that as well. Thanks, Andrew. Anyone else? Go ahead. I was thinking about disaster debris, uh, just like we clarified that contaminated soil um, belongs under CND waste. It, it might be helpful to clarify that disaster debris also belongs um, as part of this discussion. Great. To beef that up a little bit. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Task Force members. Andrew, go ahead. I'm thinking about it. I said to talk about the asphalt shields and maybe other materials to make a CD that we really don't have any possibility of recycling or reusing. And so maybe we need to look at some of those materials and figure out how the state can uh, facilitate those other materials that are difficult to uh, that we're currently unable to manage. Because again, the, like I said, the asphalt shingles are something I know can be. Um, recycled and then uh, I don't know if that created an economy of scale issue like I know on the smaller you know, maybe Oahu could do that but maybe the smaller islands can't not sure if there's a way to subsidize those types of things I know we have the grants out there but for an ongoing program the grants may not be able to handle you know an ongoing program maybe good to get started you can make them sustainable too 
You guys get that? Okay. Yes. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Ramsey, go ahead. Yeah, um, just to stream, I'll add to, we need to streamline the process. Uh, that could be the permitting process, could be the uh, the marketing process, it could be the the product itself as well. So streamlining um, could, could kind of address the egg and chicken theory. Once we streamline it, then probably we could get it in the right path. And uh, we don't have to worry about, you know, which one came first, but let's at least improve on it by the streamlining process. And I still believe that we need to from, you know, we we are capable. Um, Nicole, I know you you said you have challenge getting information because it's impossible. But I think if we reach out to our elected officials from state senates to to the house to even our local and we could obtain access so we could get some of that information but um i think if we could do that we may be able to focus on better understanding the logistics and the products so we could be able to create the marketing and the diversion for it. Thank you. Thank you. Christine, you had your hand up. Okay, so we're moving towards circularity. What are we doing? We're taking things that are going to waste, we're putting them back in the economy, right? Seems to me like there's a lot of matchmaking that could go on where here's these people and they're going to take something apart and then there's an inventory like, oh, what kind of stuff is in there? I know that Quinn already does this and we've even done a little of this with him. So, you know, some sort of like before there's demolition, there's an inventory that's made and then that information is made available, you know, on a like online marketplace. Who wants this material? Da da da. But I think, again, you know, through this idea of matchmaking and taking these cycles and circles that are being broken and putting them back together again, you know, keeping that kind of thing in mind, I think we will work it out. People want these materials. When people, regular people have access to the materials, they want the materials. So we don't have to compare what we're doing to what Home Depot is doing because on the other end of it, we have the cost of disposal and the cost of disposal is very high. So the economics work in our favor, and I think it's good to focus on that. And then I will really acknowledge whoever worked on this um, task force meeting. I feel like all of the information that was brought to us was really relevant, was really important. I just want to acknowledge you guys. I really enjoyed being part of this uh, meeting today. Thanks, Christine. Appreciate that. Um, did have a question we wanted to pose to you. I mean, given this last comment, uh, expanding the conversation, and prior to us getting into the summary, um, do you think there's a need or an opportunity to create a, a special conversation, a pig, uh, in order to do that? Is that something you'd be interested in, or is that something that we'd post, push off in order for there to be a, a larger conversation? or longer conversation? It's an inquiry on this side. Are you asking me that? Yes. But you okay. mentioned earlier about wanting to have a, a longer or a, a more extended conversation, which could be done under the particular guidelines with the creation of a pig. <clears throat> Is that right? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I'd like to also add that um, you can also provide any thoughts to us. And then in our next task force meeting, there's also opportunity to come up with uh, or come and present new ideas that you might have had between now and then as well. So that's also another opportunity for a CND discussion to continue. I'm talking about engagement between the different interests that are represented here. So I'm uh, 
that Ramsey and Ty and Quinn and um, you know the construction people and for Humanity. We're on a construction site together. We're looking, this is the system, what works, what doesn't, like really having the people drill down into the logistics. And so if that's a kind of a state sponsored thing, or that's maybe through some kind of grant program or whatever, whatever this group can do with DOH's support to move into that, because to me, that would be really, really helpful. It's, it, I think we're really at the point right now where it's about logistics. The DOH guiding or leading uh, a larger conversation, but given oh, uh, given the sunshine... Continue, oh, you mean concurrent with our planning process then, Christine? Oh, I think she's suggesting that the various components be come together for a conversation but we also understand we're operating on the sunshine mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. individual task force members really aren't allowed to talk about this particularly, but that's the yeah. topic they're in that. That's yeah. what they do, yeah. right? I mean, I understand that that would probably violate the letter of the law, um, but the way I think the way that um, we are uh, conducting the planning process, um, you know, we're taking in uh, whatever information is passed along to us, all opinions, all the information, and we're not excluding anybody. Um, you know, nothing is going to be voted on, voted in, or voted out of any particular position. Um, I think the only vote that we're going to um, actually do in the whole process is uh, determining the subject of the last meeting which is going to come up, uh, I think, at the, the wrap-up of yeah. today's meeting uh, as a reminder to the group. But um, so I think the short answer is, um, you know, uh, no, I don't think it'll be a problem. Okay. So, I'm sort of, um, talking about it being part of the planning process. I'm talking about it being a recommendation of this, this work oh, that we're okay. doing. Yeah. Okay. And, and so yeah. just like, okay, imagine yeah. Red Hill, right? Here's Red Hill. Wow, what a disaster. All these people come together to figure it out. You know, this C&D waste, it's a crisis. So what are we going to do to bring everyone together to figure out the logistics? I, I don't like the idea of working group because otherwise we're going to do what we're doing now, talk to each other on Zoom or, you know, in a building someplace. It, it really needs to be like, we need to have access to construction sites to see what systems they have in place. Guarantee the systems they have in place are systems that generate waste. So now if we're going to come up with new systems that recover resources, we have to talk to them and say, well, what if we put this thing here? Quinn should definitely be there. The county DEM people should be there. Environmentalists should be there. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Thanks, Christine. I think that helped in terms of framing it as a recommendation uh, rather than a parallel conversation right now. Thank you. Are there any other thoughts um, before we get on move to the next section, next steps in action? So, Christine, just so you know that um, I know you're probably thinking that that's something we could do like concurrently or in the immediate future. But as of this point right now, we're just taking in your um, the public and the task force comments on these things as the um, update to the ISWMP will be done later in the year. Yeah, and uh, we will include um, the recommendation of um, creating these groups and, um, you know, as a potential option just to provide more insight for both the group that gets created and the construction sites that might uh, be open for, for, for some guidance. So we will include that as part of our options. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank, thank you. All right, swinging back one more time, inviting uh, any other comments. If not, then we'll move on to next steps and action items. All righty, thank you all. We had some really good discussions throughout today's task force meeting. 
And so we wanted to move on to next steps and action items. So regarding next steps, we'll be compiling information that we received today, as mentioned, for consideration in the Integrated Solid Waste Management Plan update. And similar to the beginning of this meeting, we will also be summarizing and wrapping up our discussion on CND at our next task force meeting, which is for packaging. And that is scheduled for Thursday, March 14th. So there will be no task force meeting next month. All right, thank you. Um, so as Ramsey mentioned previously, um, we will be um, voting on a 10th item. This is to be identified, selected by the task force. Um, and so, you know, the as you can see here, we have nine material streams, tires, batteries, the statewide recycling program, organics, today's topic, CND, our next topic, packaging, carpet, mattresses, photovoltaic panels. Ahmad mentioned um, debris, uh, mass, uh, disaster debris management. That could be a potential topic. We have textiles, um, other materials that you might think are a problem for your given jurisdiction. So um, please uh, start thinking about that. And uh, during our next meeting, um, we will develop a list of potential items that we will then uh, eventually vote on so that we could um, identify our 10th item. Thank you. Yeah, just so just to clarify, at the next meeting, we will be voting on our 10th um, topic. Ramsey? Yeah, um, I'm just kind of curious. I don't see the white goods. The white goods always come as a big challenge for us as well. Um, and we just keep struggling with, you know, what to do with them. I know when you go purchase refrigerator or washer, usually they they charge you for disposal or recycling at these facilities, but yet they end up being at the transfer station or the landfill. Does that money goes to the state um, and or does it go straight to the vendor? Because I'm trying to chase the money so we could be able to have the responsible people that collecting the money be able to take care of these Y goods rather than uh, the counties or the state. So is there any ideas of what's going on with the Y goods within the states? Thank you for the question on oh, haulers. I don't know. I'm guessing that um, it's the haulers or the store that's making the delivery and they charge extra for the removal of the, the older appliances. And then uh, it's possible that someone will be dumping at the transfer stations to save themselves uh, the disposal fee and you know, pocketing that. Um, none of none of those types of fees or charges uh, comes to the state. We don't have any program related to white goods recycling or disposal. So is the state willing to, I mean, include it as a topic? Because we need, it can be, you know, there's a lot of white goods um, that need to be addressed as well as I mean you guys are addressing the high five and electronic but to me the Y gets it's a major component you sometimes you see them along the highways and etc so um, if we tighten up the program um, and try to figure out uh, if the money comes to the state rather than the vendors, maybe it could be treated like the electronic and the high five programs. I mean, it could be put on the list of uh, subjects to consider for the yeah. larger group to, to vote on. Yes. Okay. So, white like goods can be the first on the list. Yes. Yeah, that would be good. Thank you. We'll include that. Yep, we'll include that. Thank you, Rosie. 
Okay. Anything else to add, Cesar? Uh, no, just if you think of any other items, uh, feel free to uh, message us and we'll definitely have them included in our uh, next meeting for a vote. Awesome. All right, so before we close, are there any uh, last questions that you'd like to pose to the task force or task force members, to our consultants and or to one another? If not, we want to thank all of you that joined us today, especially our, our guest. Quinn, thank you for being here. Uh, all of our members of the public, thank you for joining us. And always our task force members for taking the time and, of course, bringing your expertise and passion to our meetings. All right. So until the next time, March. Is that right? March 14th. March 14th. Um, we'll see you then. Wonderful. Thank you all. Hello. Thank you. Thank you.